At long last, Meave's force reached Angren's marshy woods. Ever been? No. Count yourselves lucky. Are you certain we haven't lost our way? Alas, here there is no way. We continue south, that's all. South meaning the bottom. Should you ever venture there, I offer you this advice. Do your utmost to make no noise. <laughs> Poor soul. His comrades cried out, reached out. But alas, amidst frothing waters, they heard bones cracking, the moan of metal bent and crushed. What the bloody hell, what was that? Rather not know, personally. Hold your positions. Arms at the ready. It was a glusty war. One of many the Lyrians would encounter along their path. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. At last, Meave and her force stood upon the Yaruga's bank. To find and punish the traitor Caldwell, they would have to cross the river. Yet the sole bridge nearby was in Nilfgaard's hands. Reynard, you fought in the first war against Nilfgaard, did you not? Yes, Your Grace. Though, as a mere captain then. Were they equally cruel? Did they scorch fields, turn peasants into slaves? No, Your Grace. They fought with honor in those days. So, what's happened? Why the change? It said Emperor Emir Va Emrys's heart hardened over the years. He's grown crueler, more ruthless. His soldiers' zeal for violence has followed suit. But you don't say that. No, Your Grace. To your mind, why do they now despise us as they war against us? It is ever easier to loathe those you know. Before the first war, they knew nothing about us. Then they saw they'd the better weapons. Larger cities, superior craft. But in our towns, waste flowed through the streets in open gutters. And they concluded we weren't their equals. It's far easier to kill when one holds such a belief. Hey ho, how's my favorite queen in the north? Ever have regrets? Feel remorse? For what? Oh, I don't know. Killing innocents, perhaps? Murdering travelers, pilgrims. I've always warned them. Won't touch a hair on your heads, provided you don't resist. So, see, gave them a choice. Besides, innocence? Please, Meave. We both know those to be mythical creatures. Everyone's got something on their conscience. So there's always call for murder? That's right. Dead right. You need but answer it. Yes, my lady. I haven't had the opportunity to thank you. Had you not been so alert, we'd have fallen to our deaths in Mahakam. I merely did my duty, Your Majesty. <laughs> Modest as ever. Yet once the war is over, I shall make certain you're properly rewarded. My lady, the one reward I desire is victory. Your victory. Other matters await my attention. We shall speak later. As you wish, my lady. Hidden among brambles, Meave watched the Nilfgaardian sentries atop the palisade. In full gear, alert in stance, they looked sharp and ready to defend the stronghold. Blast! Meave hissed, for she now knew Red Lobindon would not fall by surprise. A siege would be needed, and it would slow her advance. Yet there was naught she could do, as this was her one road to Angren and to Caldwell. Reynard wiped the sweat from his brow, donned his helmet, and dropped his visor with a tap. On your command, Your Majesty. Very well. We mustn't delay. Reynard, our plan of attack. Armored infantry to lead and take the first salvo upon their breast, scaling ladders to follow. Afterwards... Masterful. Truly masterful. Interrupted Gascon. Yet, despite the mastery, fit to be improved. How namely? Hold back your force. Lie in waiting. I'll take ten good men and open the gates for you. Wide. 
And how do you aim to achieve this? Asked Reynard. Knock, and claim to be a trinket peddler, I suppose. Or perhaps one of Lebioda's devout disciples. Must you know every last detail? Where's the fun in that, sir? There's none in warfare. Never, seethed Reynard. For war is no farce. Your Majesty, he stands no chance. Not the slightest. None at all, I concur. Yet his eagerness intrigues. Let's see what he can do. Reynard did not approve of Meave's decision, this was clear, yet he dared not undermine it. The Queen's blessing now his, Gascon assembled a small force and set off straight for the stronghold gate. Lambs to the slaughter, muttered Reynard, shaking his head. My Queen, it's not too late. We can always... Shh! Look! Already at the gate, Gascon lifted his arm in a gesture of peace, then merrily bantered a bit with the guards. A moment later, the gates jerked into motion. But how? No matter. The gate stands open. We must attack. Meave raced off towards the fortress without even glancing back. She knew well her soldiers would follow. Oh! Ha ha! The strays have come to play! One red lobindon for you, milady. Compliments to the house. Gascon seemed a fiend as he fought his way to the keep, then single-handedly killed the commander. Suddenly leaderless, the Nilfgaardians laid down their arms. My, my, Gascon. Colour me surprised. Pleasantly so, I trust. Don't fish for compliments, it doesn't suit you. Besides, you know you deserve both medal and title. Ha ha ha! I shall hold you to it, my queen. In due course. But I must know how. What ruse persuaded the North Guardians to open the gate? Come, come, my delightful charms, no ruse. Ah, oh, I see. Not one to share secrets. Unremarkable, as I see it. I'd hold my tongue too, were my conscience thus burdened. I've done now to hide my shameful past, friend. I was a brigand, indeed, yet. Do not dare take me for a fool. You know of what I speak. Yet I don't. Reynard, what is this? What the devils is with you? Your Grace, in Mahakam, the Nilfgaardian letter we managed to intercept. Consider your offer accepted. Direct Meave and her force to the agreed site. We await their arrival. Your reward shall be as agreed. It was Gascon who told us Caldwell had received Angren to rule. It was Gascon who suggested we ride for Lobindon. Here, the Blackclads willingly opened the gate, for they expected him to deliver a prisoner. You! I don't... I don't believe this. No, it, it cannot be. Deny it, Gascon. Go on. Tell me I'm wrong. Do you require any more proof, Your Grace? What do they promise you? Amnesty? Coin in heaps? Ah, both. I knew Nilfgaard wouldn't parley with me as a matter of course. To be treated seriously, I needed something they valued. A stroke of luck, it was, the chance to free you from Coldwell's grip. It was in Edern that we first spoke. Then came to an understanding after Rosberg's fall. Why do I still live then? Why not snatch me under Knight's mantle, drag me to Red Lobindon in chains? Meave. I sought to sell you out, I did, and aimed to gain by it. Yet in Edern, you earned my respect. In Mahakam, my admiration. I swore then I wouldn't follow the terms of the accord I'd made. Instead, I'd let you into the fort and make damn sure the Commandant couldn't reveal the truth. Alas, seems I underestimated Reynard. Flattery will get you nout. You, sir, are a traitor. Oh, please, friend. You appear to me a pot that calls the kettle black. Reynard? What does he mean? I've no notion, Your Grace. Not the slightest. Truly? <laughs> and I had you pegged for a man of honor. Come now, Reynard. 
Who sent secret missives to Villain? Go on, you really should tell your queen. What? Reynard? His Highness guest chambers in Mahakam. One of my lads snuck in. Found a letter bearing the signature of one Reynard Odo. Reynard, I beg you. Say it's not so. Tell me it's a filthy lie. Uh, I, uh, your grace. I'd hoped his highness and you would reconcile. To see son stand against mother rent my heart. I, 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 I wish to help. Behind my back. Your majesty, I sought merely to push the youth to see reason, to open his eyes. So say you now. Yet I can't know what was in the letters. I can't know what pacts you made. And alas, I can no longer take you at your word. I'm not alone in having deceived. Yet I am in repairing my wrong. Me felt a tempest rise inside her. Yet she could not release it lest it cloud her view. She would solve the problem, strike it from her mind, and resume her journey at once. Drawn and quartered, I should have you both. Yet in truth, I cannot do without your aid. Now more than ever. Tis the one reason I show mercy and forgive. Your Grace, perhaps made with doubt, but tis the right decision. I shall prove it. Thank you. Reynard and I rarely see eye to eye. But under the circumstances, I second his every word. Oh, shut your damn traps! And I believe you're needed in the wagon train. Now! The Queen's wish was clear and fierce. Gascon and Reynard slid off, leaving Meave to her thoughts. From the Palisades rampart, Meave gazed out over the marshlands across the Aruga. The Queen sighed deeply. She expected great challenges in Angren. She had also expected, even hoped, to find the one traitor in her midst. But two, and both her close aides de camp. She felt a weight upon her heart now. Blasted all, she muttered. Not the first dagger I've taken in the back. Likely not the last either. Yet to pity my lot will help not at all. From the captive Nilfgaardians, Meave learned Caldwell was a Tuzla castle, in Angren's very heart. A small detachment would remain at Red Lobinden, while the Queen, with the rest of her force, set off to face the treacherous Count. Your Grace, I wished once more to express my gratitude for your show of mercy. I showed mercy, true, but felt much more. Anger, pain, now resentment. You hurt me, Reynard, wounded me to the bloody core. I don't know what else to say on the matter, so let's not speak of it. As you wish, Your Grace. It's time I attended to other matters. Uh, Maeve, I must say it again, I'm sorry. And I thank you for forgiving me. No need to say any more, Gascon. But you've got to know. Every time you bring it up, I'm tempted to change my mind. Now let's turn to the task at hand. I'm pleased to see you again, ma'am. You need something? You wish to speak with me? In private? Yes, ma'am. I've given thought to certain matters. The time's come to explain and reveal my decisions. I've not been entirely honest, but I've seen you very much deserve the truth. You're brave, wise, and above all, You've a good heart, and thus you're unlike any other ruler I've ever met, had dealings with. Isabel, what is it you wish to say? You're starting to worry me. I told you of Sintra and Sodden. Do you recall? It's true, I took part in that war. Yet, I fought for the Empire. What? I'm not certain I understand. My name is Isbel Ep Muirmos, of Nilfgaard. I wish I could say I am from a conquered province. I wish I had that luxury. 
But no, I hail from the city of the Golden Towers itself. My, I'd certainly not expected that. Please, tell me more. I went straight from the academy to the army, as majors do in Nilfgaard. Yet I truly believed our aim to be to build a better world. With our help, the mages, the Emperor conquered realm after realm, right up to the Amal Mountains. Yet he was not sated and turned his greedy eyes to the north. But the north stood and faced him. I'll never forget the bloodbath he wrought in Sintra. It was unspeakable. He sought to intimidate us. He united us instead. Indeed. At Sodden, when chaos engulfed the Imperial Army, I saw my chance to flee the madness and begin life anew. And I did just that. I never sought thereafter to rejoin my countrymen or return to my home. Instead, I stayed in the north and swore never again to use my magic to harm others. Yet I cannot stand idle as the Emperor perpetrates atrocity after atrocity. I wish to fight at your side. All deserve a second chance. Yet from now on, there are to be no more secrets between us. Certainly. I thank you. You've no idea what this means to me. Good. Oh, and Isabel. This must stay between us alone, for your own sake. I appreciate the concern, ma'am, but you needn't worry about me. I've lived for some time in the North, and dare say I know how to get by. The City of the Golden Towers. Don't think I know any soul who's seen it with their own eyes. Did you know many common folk believe they're made of real gold, the towers? Yet they're named for how the southern sun dances off their rooftops. My family lived in the capital long before Nilfgaard was ever an empire. The city is of great beauty, was always a source of pride, turned arrogance in time. When I was but a lass, my father would take me to the Grand Amphitheatre to watch the gladiators fight. A daughter of Nilfgaard should grow accustomed to the sight of blood, he said. For to conquer the world was our destiny. Dreadful. You must have hated it. At the time, I saw nothing wrong in it. I admired the gladiators for their bravery, skill, finesse. Though now it shames me to admit it. Duty calls. I must go. Of course. Should you need me, I'll be here. No two ways to it. Charming this county the Blacklads granted Coldwell to rape. Yes. A gift so lovely Coldwell could not refuse. Ep Dahi, it seems, wished to be rid of the Count, so as to rule Lyria alone. I do wonder why they quarrelled. Caldwell wished to rule by Willem's hand, and by his claim. Of little benefit to Nilfgaard, so the general disapproved. As do I, by all means. The Lyrians came to a crossroads. As Meave and her scouts conferred about the proper path to take, a footman, of a sudden, collapsed upon the muddy ground. His comrades strove to rouse him. Alas, to no avail. Meave called for a medic. One arrived, post-haste. He checked for wounds, a heartbeat, all else for which a medic checks. Then he peered down the soldier's throat. In a flash, he was on his feet, his hand over his mouth, backing away. What's with him? What's wrong? The Queen asked, her eyes darting between the medic and his patient. Typhus exanthematicus, your grace, replied the physician, wiping his hands with a spirit-soaked cloth. Typhus fever. Contagious? Extremely, I fear. Though not yet at this stage. The spots are but in his mouth for now. 
Tomorrow he'll be blotched all over. It's then the disease turns infectious. I see. What about a cure? Is one known? The medic looked at Meave, shook his head and shrugged. Alas, there was precisely naught he could do. But where medicine fails, magic may at times stand in. Without giving it two thoughts, Meave called for Isbel. It's Typhus, I've no doubt. The healer confirmed. I know a spell that could be helpful. Vigil's cleansing, we call it. It takes time to prepare and many ingredients. Rather costly, or... Coins no object, said Meave. Get to work at once. Isbel returned from the local herbalist with herbs valuable and rare. Fern blossoms, mandrake root, comfrey seeds, and more. She then pulled from her bundle a variety of vessels, funnels, retorts, alembics, carafes. Colored concoctions she then brewed, steam and strange odors rising from them. Hours later, after much effort, she had a few drops of a thick substance in a flask. Isbel whispered an incantation then gave the remedy to the dying man. His tremors and fever subsided at once, the other symptoms fading within hours. At last, Meave could breathe a deep sigh of relief. For no visible reason, the Lyrian column came to a halt. Meave stood in her stirrups in a bid to see the cause. Something had blocked the way, it seemed, something large. A tree felled by a storm, or an abandoned wagon, the Queen thought. Neither was true. A boulder huge as a barn lay in their path. Footmen had slung ropes around it, planted their feet, and now sought to pull it aside. It did not budge an inch. Perhaps I could assist you. Meave turned in her saddle on hearing the voice. Several travellers in faded robes warily crept from the trees. A young woman with long, light-coloured hair led the way. You don't much resemble a rock troll, said the queen, eyeing the slender stranger skeptically. But go on, do try. The fair-haired lass crouched beside the stone, closed her eyes, and began to whisper. Horses wheeled and tugged at their reins. A hound howled in the distance. And then the boulder rolled to the side like an apple crossed the deck of a boat rocked by seas. Who are you? Do tell. A druid. Came her calm response. This stone. It stood in our circle. The woman silently turned toward the wood. Me followed her gaze, and among the trees saw other large stones, cracked and scorched. What happened here? We refused the Nilfgaardian's aid. Answered the druid. So they raised our shrines. Though, perhaps it's a blessing. A blessing? How so? A darkness fell upon Angren a time past. And it grows. The forest turns savage, its creatures drunk on blood. Folk have come to worship other cruel gods. It's time we abandoned this land forsaken and went south to Kedmerkvid. Our path leads south too, though not as far, said the Queen. Do join us. Given the times, there's safety in numbers. The druids agreed and were grateful. They walked at the rear of the column, muttering prayers, their faces concealed beneath hoods. Angren lies thousands of leagues from the sea. Yet the Imperial fleet looked chiefly to this land for wood, its ashes and oaks ideal for shipbuilding. The lumber was driven down the Yoruga to shipyards in Sintra and Atra. There, day and night, Nilfgaard's fleet grew and grew. So when Meave heard axes steadily hacking, the continual grind of saws, she halted her force and quickly dispatched scouts. Indeed, they found a lumber camp, banners overhead, the great sun blazing upon them. Though not critical to her mission, Meave was nonetheless tempted to disrupt the invader however she could. The Emperor awaits a mass flow of logs, called the Queen, drawing her sword. But we shall send him corpses! Formation! Follow me! When the Lyrians rushed forth with a cry on their lips, the lumberjacks dropped their axes. Their black-clad guards, though likewise surprised, formed up and stood ready for battle. Larvan! Essay to Navin! Lyrian! 
Nilfgaard's ranks folded. Soldiers fled in fright, stumbling over felled trees and corpses. The air was heavy with the scent of resin and blood. As she caught her breath, the queen looked about. Hundreds of trees lay cut down in rows. Oak and ash enough to keep the shipyards working till winter. Neve ordered the lumber requisitioned, yet one of the loggers approached her. A man with a face like old leather, sawdust in his hair. Good lady, I know you war hard against Nilfgaard. I know you'd keep timber out of their hands, but then see, we won't get paid. We'll see no coin till Sintra's shipyard see lumber. It's what the black lads said. I beg you, have mercy. We're simple folk. Been slaving since spring, got families to feed. And hunger looms ever close in wartime. Neve looked at the logger's hands. Thick scars, crisscrossed fingers twisted by years of axe work. This wood I cannot allow to reach Nilfgaardian shipyards, she said. Yet neither can I let you go hungry. I shall take the wood and pay you from my own purse. You've a big heart, my lady. Not many folk like you, especially not in Angren. <laughs> the land be deviled in many ways. Got blisters on my hands from all this work. Weren't enough the cones on me feet, ye gods. In the distance, Meave spotted a spindle-like shape, which soon proved an enormous, dark obelisk. It stood in the middle of a wetland clearing. Dozens of iron rings dangled from its shaft, clinking and rattling in gusts of wind. Cows, donkeys, and dogs were gathered round the stone, all tied to the rings by ropes. Their hides showed many shallow cuts, seeping blood, festering, drawing mosquitoes in swarms. A number of the animals struggled against their cords, while others, near dead, lay still in the wet, tall grass. Across the clearing, folk emerged from the woods, a handful of peasants with a mule in tow. The beast resisted, stomped and planted its hooves, perhaps sensing its gruesome fate. The queen decided to question the peasants, and soon learned the animals were their sacrifice to the swamp gods. They're all about, dearie, very close. Oh, very, very close. The toothless old woman whispered. They hide neath murky waters, can't feed when they hear the drip drip of blood. The gods look kindly on those what make an offering. I know nothing of your gods, began the queen, her nose crinkled in disgust. But any that demand such grisly tribute are not at all worthy of reverence. What you do to these creatures is savagery. Savagery I can't allow. Run us off, you can, replied the old shrew. For as soon as you're gone, we'll come back. As ever, we'll come back. This I know. So I must take care to leave you now to come back to. Over the peasants' howls and pleas, Meave ordered the obelisk brought down. Her soldiers gripped the ropes that hung from it and toppled the shaft. As it hit the ground, it shattered into many smaller pieces. You say you know naught of our guts? The old woman's eyes narrowed, her voice grew darker still. Well, don't you worry your head, sweetie. You'll meet him soon enough. They'll tangle your part. So a pox among you drive it to madness. Every last one. I curse you. All of you. In Gernagora's name. Undisturbed by the Haridan's scream threats, Meave rode on. But her men whispered long of the curse. It weighed on their minds, poisoned their hearts. Each misstep, misfortune, they saw as punishment for their sacrilege. Meave stood waiting while her scouts cut through the tangled branches and roots that had overgrown the trail through the swamp. Suddenly, a soldier doubled over and began to retch blood. The same symptoms soon afflicted others in her ranks. A potent poison, was the medic's verdict. It seemed all those who'd fallen ill had shared a tent. 
One night, they'd chatted about an obelisk they'd destroyed and the group of incensed peasants who'd cursed them for it. Fearing for their lives, the footman had gone to a local herbalist. She'd brewed them a potion to ward off black magic. Alas, the concoction had proved poisonous, while the herbalist had vanished without a trace. Happily, Isbul concocted an antidote in time to deliver the soldiers from a certain and agonizing death. The mage explained their misfortune had not issued from a dark, corrupt force, but from simple human wickedness. Her calming voice and gentle smile lifted the soldiers' spirits. Trusting in her care, they soon wholly forgot the so-called curse. In Angren, all decomposes, be it dead or very much alive. Rot blights trees, seeping sores torment beasts, and the whole swamp emits the acrid, stifling stench of decay. So when, in the swamp's distant corner, the Lyrians caught whiffs of smoke and roasted meat, they stopped dead in their tracks. The scouts followed their noses to a clearing framed by a palisade. Through the gaps in the posts, they spotted a small fort. Any banners upon it? Whose do you see? Asked the Queen. There aren't none, Your Grace. Not one golden sun, not one silver lily. Meave gave the gate a few solid knocks with her shield. Moments later, a dozen armed men appeared atop the rampart. The one who led them wore a beard. Who are you? Why are you here? I'm Meave, Queen of Lyria and Rivia. At war with Nilfgaard, I ventured into these swamps. <laughs> Is there a war on? <laughs> hey, that's news. Certainly, but little concern to me. The name's Gimpy Gerwin, and I rule these lands. Is that so? As conferred upon you by whom? By me! <laughs> Angren's a good bit larger than folk think. And no duke's or emperor's fingers stand to reach its every corner. Thus I just up and took this particular nook. Made it mine. So let's parley, Meave. One ruler to another. At the risk of being blunt, I don't care who wins this war. But I want to be in good standing with whoever does. So, I offer you a fire at which to warm your limbs. Also, a place at my table and beds for you to rest. On condition, you pledge to me one very small thing. To respect the sacred laws of hospitality. So be it. I do solemnly swear before the gods and my ancestors that we shall honour all the lords of hospitality. <laughs> then you're most welcome inside. The fort was simple, built of logs, covered with thatch. Oh, but inside, it was warm, dry. Hot, steaming dishes were piled upon platters, the tables beneath them bent from their weight. Smiles appeared on her soldiers' drained faces, and Meave's spirits were lifted at last. Gerwin proved a cordial host and eagerly shared both food and tales. He'd led a mercenary band, and they'd stumbled into Angren, discovered a land unclaimed by any feudal lord. He directed the fort, then united the surrounding villages under his very own rule. The folk here are savage, defiant, he said, sipping wine. I keep them on a tight lead for their own good. Elsewise, they'd slit your throat first chance they got. Late that night, Meave went to see if her mare had been dressed. In the stable, she happened on a farmhand. Recognizing the queen, the man fell to his knees and averted his eyes. Meave noticed a strange object dangling from a rope around his neck. A human hand half rotted to the bow. What? What is that? My wife's hand, your grace, stammered the peasant. Lord Gerwin caught a sneak in some grub. Scraps, really. Took her and told me to wear it, so I'd remember what happens when... When... 
Meave left the stable without uttering another word. She went straight to the servants' barracks. In the pale glow of her torch, she looked over the peasants, all terrified, all with fresh, bleeding wounds. The queen felt rage rise inside her. The queen blew her horn. Lyrian soldiers filled the yard. They hastily donned their armor, strapped on their swords. Unsure of Meave's intentions, Gerwin's men likewise stood at the ready, weapons in hand. Gerwin! roared Meave. Get out here at once! The stout mercenary stood at his window, glaring from beneath his furrowed brow. I don't know what you think you're doing, he called. But I kindly remind you of your oath and the laws. I've seen your laws. You're strict and they're cruel. So your rule will end now. Attack! I didn't think a queen would so easily break her word. Ah! Remove this pile of manure from my sight. Lame as he was, Gerwin had been a mercenary. He fought hard, he fought well, yet still proved no match for Meave. She knocked his axe from his hand, he fell to his knees, then she cleaved his head clear off. It rolled like a gourd and came to rest at the peasant's feet. You've your freedom back, growled Meave as she wiped her sword. Yet do not take it for granted. Nilfgaard is in Angren. The Blackclads will come here too. As long as the golden sun flies over the marsh, you must hide in the woods. Meave's force left the fort before dawn. She rode at the fore, lips pursed, jaw clenched. A stain on her honour. She'd broken her word. Apart from all else, it stung on the inside. <coughs> Your Majesty, are you well? Yes. <coughs> yes, but the stench. Meave rode at the front, her eyes fixed on the ground, and thus spotted the pit masked by leaves and branches. She tugged hard on her reins and steered her mount to the side. Alas, the cavalryman behind her did not follow her lead. Leaves rustled, boughs snapped, and the horseman crashed to the pit's bottom, snapping his neck. Moments later, it was clear who'd set the trap when the forest came alive and a cry rang out. It's a trap! Rally to me! Caught between Lyrian hammer and Skelligan stone, Nilfgaard was shattered, destroyed. The victors now stood eyeing each other. These islanders were not like those Meave had met before. They wore no armor and carried no shields. At their fore stood a man as stout as an ox and bald as an ancient ghoul. His men called him Arnjolf, the patricide. I thank you for your aid, Arnjolf, said Meave, extending a hand. Aid, she says. Aid? Do you hear that, mates? <laughs> the Skelligers exchanged glances, then erupted in roaring laughter. Not here to help you, not at all. We're after killing. Join me and you shall have your fill. Join usance? <laughs> Just who the hell are you? Meave, Queen of Rivia and Lyria. Meave? Arnjolf said, his tone sobering. I know the name. Lippy Goodman called ye bold. Praise your courage to the high heaven. So be it. We'll follow ye into fire, wench. Just let us taste of blood. Grant us a death worthy of heroes. Meave couldn't help but smile, then nodded to accept. The Lyrians stepped aside as tattooed warriors joined their ranks. The scouts rode at the fore, with Meave right behind them. Their task, to find safe passage for the rest of the force. One among them probed for the quagmire's depth, a pole of five ells in hand. Suddenly, all heard a loud clang. The scouts dismounted, then heaved a bronze statue from the mire. Once it was cleaned of slime and muck, Meave instantly recognized its elven handiwork. The sculpture was exceedingly well-preserved, save one detail. 
someone had removed its face, leaving a black hole in its stead. Search the environs, ordered Meave. Amongst some brambles, they discovered the entrance to a vast tomb. Its doors had been torn open. On the ground before them lay scattered bones, some yellowed with age, others fresh, cracked and tattered from having been gnawed. Neve stood silent and contemplating at the tomb's threshold. Then, torch in hand, she entered and waded into fetid waters. Her soldiers followed close, arms at the ready, a nervous sweat on their brows. Frescoes on the tomb walls depicted Angren swamps and the beasts that prowled them. Two words were inscribed over the largest of the horrors, Gvern Iker. Suddenly, a roar thundered from deeper inside the tomb. Meave turned from the frescoes to see monstrous eyes blazing in the dark. I think that's the last of them, but keep your weapons at the ready. In her torch's feeble glow, the queen examined the beast's corpse. She could not help but to shudder in disgust. Perhaps it's better, she thought, that we faced it in the dark. At the corridor's end, they found a closed door. Before any could draw near, it opened with a crash. Beyond lay a circular room. Light shone through a hole in the chamber's ceiling, illuminating a stone pedestal and the sword that lay upon it. The air in here, it crackles with magic, whispered Isbel. Meave gripped the blade's hilt. A soothing warmth filled her arms and spread across her shoulders. Her tired muscles ceased trembling. Her fingers, stiff as sticks, relaxed. She brandished her prize, the air hissing as the blade sliced through it. She then nodded approvingly. The reward had been worth the risk. Meave and the horseman beside her exchanged a perplexed glance. They'd heard the song clearly, both its tune and its verse. Whoever had hollowed it had to be close, and given their diction rather well oiled. Moments later, a hamlet appeared to the Lyrian's tired eyes. A great bonfire blazed at its center. Around it danced peasants, barefoot, giggling, hooting, joyful and carefree. One by one, they noticed the queen. Soon, all were silent, huddled together, children peering from behind their backs. Fear not, said Meave. We mean you no harm. What do you celebrate? A lad's grooming? Nuptials? Nay, my lady. Hell yes. The gods have been kind. Filled us nets and snares with game. Come time, we thank them. Yes. You've things to be thankful for. We do, my lady. And we's poor folk. So a queen. Well, you must as well. Your Majesty, stay tonight, feast with us. There'll be music and plenty of room by the fire. <sighs> Why not? Began me, daintily dismounting. We all deserve some respite, I suppose. The Lyrians needed no convincing. With astonishing haste, they removed mail and helmets then eagerly joined in the fating and dance. Amidst the trilling of flutes, fifes and fiddles, all those gathered reveled until dawn. They could rest at last, forget about Nilfgaard and the many beasts that prowled among the reeds. They'd long remember that night, the carefree laughter, peasant maids whirling in dance, the ale cold as a mountain spring, and the bread they crisped over the fire. One exchange in particular etched itself into the Queen's mind, an exchange she overheard. Not a little, not even a teeny tiny bit. I'll say it again, it's not your concern. Of course it's not. Wouldn't be so damn curious if it were. So be it. Keep your silence. But um, those eyes like the summer sky, that hair like waves of grain. 
I see the way you gape. What do you two speak of? Uh, your majesty. <laughs> Couldn't have answered that better myself. Who does Reynard gape at? Bah, the new ballista, what else? Ah, what a piece of work. Pure art, I say. Can't tear your eyes away for an instant. Haven't you two held enough from me already? Don't play me for a fool. What's this about? Me, honestly, you do better to... It's a private matter, Your Grace. One of the heart, you might say. If you'd allow it, I'd rather not share the details of our conversation. All right. I'll leave you to discuss whatever men discuss. Consider me gone. Me turned and walked back to the fire, sat down on an old stump. Ha! That was close. I... Shh! And the faintest of smiles crossed her lips. Meave expected the villagers to request recompense for their welcome. Yet the peasants made not the slightest mention of coin, and the queen was much moved by their kindness. Once again, those with the least had proved the most willing to share. The Lyrians did not assemble come the morn. The force marched off in the afternoon, unshaven, unbathed, disheveled. Not normally one to overlook contempt for discipline, that day Meave understood even soldiers needed to let their guard down, at times. Admire, admire, ample harvest year, for our mistress all need be kneeled. Oh, clay pad, oh, clay pad, play us more, you pros. Sing again, we'll dance a bit, and then we'll fix your nose. <laughs> Sensing a limp in her mount's gait, Meave ordered the column to halt. There was a thorn in her mare's hoof, burrowing deeper with every step. The horse whinnied and pulled her leg away, but Meave knew how to calm her. She stroked the mare's cheek, whispered slow words in her ear, she then extracted the thorn without difficulty. I'm sorry to interrupt, said the druid from behind Meave's back. Yet this is where our paths diverge. We've a modest gift to thank you for the road shared, and for your aid at the obelisk to the marsh gods. Meave wished to respond, but the druids had turned toward the woods, their satchels slung over their shoulders. The queen waited till they were out of sight to open the bundle. Their gift was by no means modest. The trees no longer wish us here. They call for someone else. In Angren swamps, one can easily lose one's way. Thick fog fills the air. Paths end without warning. Dense thickets obscure the distance. The sole way to determine one's position is to climb a tree and peer out over the canopy. This duty fell to Meave's scouts while the force halted below. During one such delay, Meave caught the words she'd longed to hear. Majesty! Tuzla Castle! Its tower! I see it! To her soldiers' astonishment, Meave cast off her gauntlets and started up the nearest trunk. She longed to see the castle for herself, but then she would know sweet vengeance was at hand. The climb proved tricky as the trunk was slippery and the branches, run through with rot, were frail. Yet Meave showed herself to be skillful and spry. As a child, she had loved to scale trees, much to her governess' dismay. Meave looked out to see a mighty stone tower outlined against the horizon. Legend holds Tuzla Castle was to have had three such bastions. Yet King Ragbard, the fort's benefactor, had forsaken the effort when yet another stone transport simply sank into Angren's boggy roads. It was a moment of respite for Meave, a moment of quiet joy. She breathed and tasted air free of the bog stench. She took in silence undisturbed by the hum of mosquito swarms. And she relished her prospects, the coming battle against Caldwell.
The soldiers stood exhausted and filthy, many with raspy coughs, all sick of the meager gruel. But with the command to advance, a new strength sparked within them. Their step was lively, a fire burned in their eyes, each hoping to spill Caldwell's entrails, then dash them upon the fort walls. Yet as they drew near the stronghold, perched atop a stone aisle, their verve dwindled, enthusiasm waned. They had taken fortresses with thicker walls, taller towers, and manned by more men. Yet they'd never seen nor laid siege to a fort standing on land so ill-suited. To rush the bulwarks through waist-deep mud. Was this even possible? Prove I was no fool to keep you at my side, said Meave, turning to Gascon and Reynard. A slaughter I must avoid. How will I do it? Your grace, began Reynard. Set our machines to sling boulders. At the west wall, it's weakest. Tis our best chance at a breach. Our men will need cover, added Gascon. Reeds we must harvest and burn. Smoke will cloak us. Conceal us from the castle's defenders. Good, agreed the queen. Now get to work. Amidst billowing blue smoke, Lyrian footmen rushed through the breach wrought by Reynard's catapults. Though she had yet to forgive her companions, Meave had to admit they'd given her sound advice. Coldwell, I've come for your head! I knew you'd come. Your lofty pride presages another dramatic fall. Yeah! No one touch him! The count is mine! Many of Meave's victories have been immortalized in poetry and song, but not the fall of Tuzla. Lyrians fought Lyrians, brothers killed brothers, in rain and mud midst a cursed swamp. Certainly nothing to inspire a bard. Near the battle's end, Meave stormed the great stone tower to which Caldwell had fled. The queen ascended the stairs, dealing blow after blow, blood cascading down in her wake. She reached the top floor to find the Count waiting, with no intention to defend himself. If it's mercy you expect, you'll be sorely disappointed. Mercy? I know you all too well for that, Meave. Ever vindictive and cruel. All this from a paragon of knightly virtues. You stabbed me in the back, Caldwell, and used Willem to do so. My son! Who agreed without a moment's hesitation? Forsaken by your own son, your flesh and blood. What's that say about you? Oh, you tread on thin ice. Choose your next words carefully. Spare me your threats. You'll kill me all the same. Death can come in many ways, Count. Some quick, some slow. My, my. How you strut and vaunt. Terribly sure of yourself. Perhaps too sure. Your castle is mine. I've crushed your force. I dare say no, I'm not. Precisely my point. Don't you see? The Empire's not one army. It's dozens, hundreds. It's what I strove to knock into that thick dome of yours. Alas, you're too much a dullard. Soon as I'd learned you'd crossed into Angren, I sent for reinforcements. They'll be here soon. Three regiments, armed to their teeth. <laughs> Nilfgaardians seem ever to have the upper hand, yet I find the means to defeat them. Not this time, Meave. Nilfgaard comes in numbers. Ten Imperial footmen to each and every one of yours. You'll not win, nor can you flee. Do you know why? Enlighten me. I dare you. But one bridge leads to Tuzla. As it happens, I ordered it raised as you laid siege. The swamps around the castle are too deep to cross. Try to rebuild the bridge, the Imperial troops will arrive before you can finish. Your men, they'll slay as you watch, and then they'll wring your neck. I wouldn't be so pleased were I you. You won't live to see this outcome. I know that. But I take heart in the truth. Though the castle you've seized and will likely kill me, I've won. Outsmarted you, Meave. Twice now. 
And you know what? It wasn't even that hard. With those words, with his arrogance and contempt, Caldwell had gone too far. The Queen gripped his shoulders, pushed. Caldwell stumbled backwards, then tripped out the window. A blood-chilling shriek filled the courtyard, then broke off abruptly. Now fool me thrice. Try. Meave slapped the dust from her hands. The traitor had met a deserving end at last. Yet this was no time to revel in the Count's demise. If Caldwell had spoken the truth, the Queen and her army were in grave danger. Meave scouts quickly confirmed the traitor's claim. The bridge was indeed in flames, and Nilfgaardian regiments were advancing from the south. Now to confirm if there was truly no other route by which they could flee. The Queen ordered her men to ask the local peasants. One of their number, a stable hand who'd lived near Tuzla all his life, claimed a secret path led out the back of the stronghold. King Ragbard himself ordered it built. Had him drop great stones into its swamp, one after another, like beads on a string. Bitter water covers them, so you can't see Nout at start. You can make him out if you go proper slow, though. <sighs> what is it? The stones. They lead to Isgith. And there, my lady, lurks an evil worse nor any black-clad army. What? A beast of some sort? Some say beast. Others, God. Gernikora, they call her. And you'll yet see, my lady. Isgith shines red with your blood. A silly tale to frighten children, Meave thought at first. Then paused. For something about the man's voice made his every word believable. None too encouraging. Yet preferable to certain death. Tell me, from Iskith, will we reach the banks of the Yuruga, near Red Lobindon, perchance? Aye, Your Majesty. You need but head north. And pray all along the way. Soon, Meave stood where the stable hand had said she should, at the edge of a vast marsh. Carefully, she dipped a foot into the broth and probed for solid ground. Sure enough, she found stone. One cautious step, then another. Meave slowly strode off towards Isgith. <laughs>